All right, hey everybody. Sean Lane here from Drift. I head up sales operations here, and we are very lucky to be joined by Mark Roberge. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sean. Mark, if you don't know, is the former CRO of HubSpot. Um, he's an author, he's now a lecturer. Um, so wanted to talk a little bit with you about your path and also mm -hmm. just like sales in general. Yeah, cool. excited to be here again, Sean. Uh, thanks for having me. Of course. So first, you don't have the kind of typical path that a sales executive yeah. has had. Um, you actually studied mechanical engineering in college. Can you connect those dots for me from mechanical engineering to sales executive? Yeah, I guess, I mean, like any 17 or 18 year old, your parents tell you you're good at math, you're gonna be an engineer one day. So <laughs> that's what I did and I found it to be, as I graduated and looked at engineering roles, they seemed quite boring. I went into actually computer programming. So okay. I did that and managed some you know engineering teams for uh, the beginning years of my uh, career, fell in love with entrepreneurship, became an entrepreneur, and somehow like accidentally landed in you know the fourth hire at HubSpot and first salesperson in this career of sales. And so it was uh, really lucky, blessed, and serendipitous that I had this like data-driven mindset from my time in engineering, my time at MIT, to like you know when I get nervous and I have goals and I'm stressed, I moved to science and data. Mm. And it was a beautiful time in, in the world of sales where so many teams were going from field to inside mm -hmm. that there was now data available. And, and, and that set the tone for sort of uh, partially contributing to a reinvention of this function in a very data-driven way. And so how did you then take that data-driven mindset and apply it to the way you guys were growing the sales team at HubSpot? Yeah, I really think in every dimension of building a sales team from how we hire, how we train people, how we coach people, how we generate demand, those were kind of the four pillars. And I, and I really set up a data-driven way on each one of those. You know, on hiring, you know, really trying to quantify how I assess people on coachability, on curiosity and intelligence, and over time drew correlations between my interview assessment and their ultimate performance. Um, you know, in, in, in lead generation, really quantifying the demand gen that we're feeding people on a monthly basis. So it's one of the cool opportunities we don't take enough advantage of in sales is when we think about sales relative to engineering and, and, and even customer success or marketing, success and failure in sales mm. is highly quantifiable, right. right? Like there's the engineering team this over the there, product. right? Like if I'm looking at the engineering team, I can't be like, hey, Sean, that right there is my best engineer by 7%. Like, mm. how do you do that, right. right? In sales with the team here, we can get pretty close. And so to not take advantage of these like mm. statistical correlations to predict success is, is just a lost opportunity when you're scaling a business. And so it's one thing to have all those systems and it's one thing to, to quantify that and I think I've heard and read stuff that you guys did at HubSpot around, particularly things with like lead segmentation or like how do you decide which leads make it to the team and when. Mm -hmm. How do you take all those systems, all these things that you're quantifying and then translate that to the team so that everyone understands the mm. why behind yeah. all these systems you're making? I think your question is kind of getting at the fundamentals of proper sales and marketing alignment. Okay. Right? And, and that's like, um, that's a big deal these days for organizations. You know, I've, I've probably worked with a thousand organizations through my time at mm -hmm. HubSpot um, with their sales and marketing team. And as you can imagine, these teams typically don't get along. Mm. You know, like um, marketing thinks that sales is, is a bunch of overpaid, spoiled brats. Yep. And salespeople think that marketing does arts and crafts all day. And they're just like pissed at each other and they kind of revert to their corner of the office and marketing does their trade show booths and sales does their cold call. That was fine in the 80s and 90s, mm -hmm. but today, when so many buying journeys start in a domain owned by by marketing, like the website, yep. um, you know, in Drift, yeah, or, you know, yeah, like yep. um, in, in social media, and then they migrate to a domain owned by sales, that alignment is a huge competitive advantage if you have it. And if you don't, it's you're just setting yourself up for failure. Right. So it doesn't feel and like so, you're just throwing stuff over the fence. Yeah. So the cornerstone to your question was sitting down with marketing at the leadership level and having a really getting precise around what is a qualified lead and what isn't. Mm -hmm. And it's not like sales is trying to be like, be ultra picky, like I'm only calling CEOs who request a demo. Like that's not reasonable, right? Mm -hmm. So just having a conversation about, you know, what is a qualified lead, what is not, why, maybe even have the CEO and other folks partic participate. And, and that's the, con the, the foundation for that SLA that we can then go to market and say, here's the target. And then we can go to sales and be like, that's a callable lead. Mm. Right. And I would assume then that builds trust between those groups, not just in the managers and executives who are making those decisions, but at, down at the individual contributor level. Yeah, well. we get away from a world where it's like, hey, I didn't hit my quota because the leads suck. Right. Like there's no such thing. It's right. like there's a clear SLA. Like marketing needs to generate a million dollars of lead value this month. They either do it or they don't. Mm. And if they do, you got to hit your number. 
And if you don't hit your number, it's because you're wrong or the SLA is wrong, and we can right. revisit that. And you can go back but it just, it just brings the accountability level down to much more science. And so I feel like sometimes for companies, though, that were growing really fast, and like Drift is, and you start to put systems and processes and measurements around things. And sometimes for sales, it's like, that can be, those can be scary words, mm -hmm. right? And so is there still an argument where there's like an art and a science of selling? Or are you saying mm -hmm. we should be going all in on just the science? Yeah, part? so two points there. Number one is there always has to be a really clear what's in it for me from the rep standpoint. Mm -hmm. Like anytime you implement a system or an, an input or a drop down box and say, hey, I'm your manager, fill this out for me. And it creates more work for you, Mr. or Mrs. Salesperson. It's never gonna happen. Right. Right, so you, when you think about the reports you wanna generate and you think about how you're gonna engineer your sales tech stack, there also has to be like, why does this design make the salesperson's job three times easier? So if I can make the salesperson's job three times easier and collect the data behind the scenes, that's a successful implementation. The other point of your question is, you know, there is still art, okay. right? Like when, when you think about a discovery call and we think about a, uh, a training guide for a discovery call, mm -hmm. that's not a script. It's not like, Sean, ask this question, then ask this question, then ask this question. It's like, it's about listening and reacting and using the words and, and driving away. At the same time, they need some guidance. Sure. So, Doing that without you know, you can do like, yeah, a blueprint that says like, usually the first 10 minutes or five minutes about rapport. And here's some things you might do in rapport. And then you migrate to like high level need identification. And here's some sample questions that are good to ask at that point. So you can put together guides, but there's still a lot of flexibility for the rep to be a human and mm -hmm. just and just listen to them. And has that changed since you started at HubSpot? So like, it's been over 11 years since you started there. Has that dynamic shifted? What, what are you seeing now that's different? Yeah, dramatically. I mean, when I started there, the majority of sales teams were field sales teams selling multi-million dollar enterprise software. Mm -hmm. And the challenge then was just getting anyone to fill out the CRM, right? These are pretty expensive, relatively experienced salespeople that are leveraging their like, you know, their yacht club and golf course membership to get into deals, taking people to steak dinners, right. and you know, a management team that's saying, hey, what's going on with your pipeline? How many appointments are you having? Like, don't worry about it. I know what I'm doing, let me do my job, right? Moving to inside, where it's like, the first time I built the team at HubSpot, I was like, how am I gonna get my reps to use the CRM? Because I know that's the biggest problem every sales team. Not a problem at all. It's like they, they couldn't, it's like, it's like trying to sell without a phone. Right. Like they had to use a CRM just to know what's going on. So suddenly like CRM adoption wasn't a problem at all. And it opened up this entire opportunity that we're taking advantage of now of codifying things. Mm. And to some degree, like we codified it too much. You know, so? we, just the scripted selling that can happen, like the, 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 the prospecting cadences, mm. you know, like, you know, having a debate between is it, am I better off having a rep reach out to 30 prospects a day in a very human, personalized way, or have them reach out to 200 prospects a day with the same message. Mm -hmm. There's a debate, and we can measure sure. that, but we don't account from the data is, even if the, the take rate is more profitable here, and let's say you get 10 appointments, that's 190 people that had like an arguably fishy experience, yeah. right? And so, so we have swan really heavily toward the codified, non-human scripted mm -hmm. um, angle, and we might probably swan too far. Yeah, I think we talk about that a lot at Drift too, right? The idea of having more of a human interaction. That's why the whole conversation is the, the center of everything that we do. And so I think that by swinging too far in the other direction, you lose a little bit of that just for the sake sometimes of hitting the metric or yeah, hitting the metric. Yeah, and they count, oftentimes when you evaluate the two options, there's just a straight numbers evaluation without looking at the brand impact. Mm of the experience that those other 190 people had that didn't respond, what are they thinking about Drift now? Or what are they thinking about your brand now? And then how do you measure that as an impact on them either becoming a customer when they are a customer later on, right? Like, so if you had that, like you said, fishy mm -hmm. experience, yeah. how do you know that that it was a factor later on in deciding to buy or not? I'm not, sh I'm not sure. Like, I mean, that, that's a good question that very few people are asking, mm -hmm. very few people are going into. So maybe, and it's, I think it's an important one. I think the best thing we did at one point was we hired, I don't, I don't even know how marketing did it, but I think they hired a, a third party firm that um, we gave them like um, 300 accounts that didn't buy from us mm -hmm. in the last six months. And they were able to do a bunch of interviews um, 
uh, and, and find out as truthfully as possible why and deliver that feedback to us. Mm. So that, that was really useful for us. I don't know how they did it, but maybe we should be doing more of that to, to get a sense of like the Almost impacts like the of these, exactly what's, what's going on. Got it. Um, so I know one of the other pieces that we wanted to talk a little bit about is um, just like this customer value piece. Yes, right. Um, and so once we get customers in the door, I know you've been spending more time these days talking a little bit about like the actual value and retention of those customers. Yeah. Like, can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So like one of the big shifts we've talked about so far has been the move to inside sales the, um, and the opportunity for data-driven sales okay. management. The other big shift that I'm seeing almost more so, because like I think everyone gets the data thing now, but what they don't appreciate is the importance to, you know, I guess it, I'd classify it as an unhealthy, premature relationship with revenue growth. Unhealthy, so I think premature relationship Premature with revenue. revenue growth, okay. that's the goal. So what I see a lot of times is like, you know, as an entrepreneur ecosystem, we've evolved away from raise a million dollars, sit in a room for a year with engineers, build a product that we think will work, and then go try to sell it. Mm -hmm. Like we're so, thanks to like Lean Startup and Agile and Eric Reese's work and Steve Blanks, like, we know to involve the customer and be really agile, have a theory and hypothesis on what the product is, involve customers, build MVPs, iterate, iterate, learn, 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 and get to product market fit. Mm -hmm. What happens after that, I think, is where so many companies fall apart, is they have that, then they raise $5 million, hire 20 reps the next month, and a year later, they end up firing 20 reps because they don't appreciate the, the what I'd call go-to-market fit mm -hmm. in establishing the foundation necessary for scale. Okay. And the first part is not like once you have five companies that love your product and it's bug free and you have so-and-so product market fit, the first step is to show that you actually can create customer value consistently. So it's not about getting to five million next year, mm -hmm. it's about signing up 20, 30, 40 customers knowing that 80% of them love your product, use it every day or whatever the metric is. They, they, they saw the ROI that you promised them during the mm. sales process. That needs to be the first goal. And there's, as you think about that goal, there's a lot of insight in terms of who you hire, how you compensate them, where you set up codified program, uh, processes in your go-to-market to support that goal that I think a lot of companies miss. So it's, it's kind of the distinction between growth at all costs, yes. just to hit a number, right. versus high quality growth. Right, in my opinion, it's a th three sequences, which is step number one is customer success. Show me that you consistently um, you know, create customer value with the customers you're signing up every month. Which varies depending on your product and your company. Once you check that, uh, um, it's, it's unit economics. Show me that you can do that profitably. Mm -hmm. So that's when we get into codified sales programs, hiring, et cetera. Once you can do that, let's grow. Let's add one rep a month. Let's start spending more on marketing and let's watch those numbers. Mm. If they break, let's stop and fix it. If they don't, let's go faster. So it's, it's, a, it's sort of a growth playbook that you can get a little more down in the science than just, oh, let's hire 20 reps and go. Right, because they are going to do the exact same thing that the 20 we already have are exactly. doing, right? And yeah. that's the dangerous assumption that right. you can make. Now that you're learning things like this mm. and you know, you're uh, advising companies and you're a teacher, like, where do you turn to, to to continue learning and make sure that you're yeah. at like not getting All stale. the time, I mean, the good thing, the, the amazing thing for my career right now is I see like 50 times the data points every month. Mm. I mean, when I was, you know, when I was executive at HubSpot, I had time for maybe five <laughs> a month and I loved it. And now it's all I do. I mean, I, my students at Harvard are constantly coming to my office with different ideas and different companies are going through. They're mentoring companies, I see those. I do a, a lot of investing and I see a lot of deal flow there. I do a lot of advising and board work. So, you know, it's, it's not that I'm like externally smart. It's just like anyone who sees 50 data points a month is gonna start putting some patterns together. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's been just really fun to take a step back and, and help companies connect with each other in, in getting through hurdles that they're seeing and help codify some of these issues so that the, the entrepreneur ecosystem can benefit. Awesome. Well, Mark, thank you very much for doing this. Thanks, Sean. Really John. appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, it was a blast. Awesome.